All right, so uh, this week we have our own uh, Josh Cooper uh, talking to us about the two equators of the permutohedron. So take us away, Josh. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is joint work with uh, a couple of New Zealanders. Um, uh, two at uh, University of Waikato, uh, it's Iba Frank and Jeffrey Holmes. And then uh, uh, Rory Mitchell is actually a component of his uh, PhD thesis. Uh, he's now at NVIDIA. Um, this is gonna be interesting because when I, I gave, I've given this talk or some portion of this talk before, and it was a five minute talk. So I spoke very, very quickly and didn't get to everything I wanted to. So I've expanded it and we'll see what five minutes turns into today. Um, all right, so what is this weird word, permutohedron? Um, all right, so the order in permutohedron, it's a polytope where the vertices are permutations. Uh, more precisely, it's the convex hull of all the n vectors, n dimensional vectors, where the entries are one through n. Um, so if you think about what that looks like, okay, well, you've got, for example, one, two, and two, one. Um, that's the n equals two case. And okay, it lives in the plane, but you just get a line segment because it has two vertices. And so it's this first polytope. And then, okay, well then it's three, you get, okay, these six vertices and uh, they, they live in three space, of course, because n equals three, but um, they all live in the x plus y plus z equals six plane. And so it's actually one dimension lower and turns out you get a nice regular hexagon out of it. Um, and then it lives inside the, uh, the standard simplex, which is the portion of that plane that x plus y plus z, et cetera, equals a constant uh, intersected with the first orthant. Um, and then if you move up to n equals four, now, okay, you get all 24 vertices is a, what a truncated cube octahedron or something. Um, and again, this actually lives in the x plus y plus z plus w equals uh, 10 plane or hyperplane dimension three. Um, but if you pull it back to three dimensions, you just perform an affine transformation to put it in three space, it looks like this nice regular uh, cube octahedron. And of course you continue, but then it's much harder to picture. So this is the permutahedron. It's got lots of amazing properties. It's really a beautiful object, um, highly studied. Uh, first of all, of course, it's got n factorial vertices. Not hard to see that they're all on the uh, convex hull. Uh, so they are actually all vertices. Um, furthermore, each vertex, you might wonder what the neighbors of a vertex are, because clearly there's this, there's this one skeleton, the, the vertices and the edges of the uh, polytope. So uh, what are the neighbors of a vertex? It's the permutations you can get by performing an adjacent transposition. Uh, so if you look, for example, the two, four, one, three there, that vertex, uh, its neighbors are two, three, one, four, that you could get by uh, swapping the, uh, what is it, the third and fourth places. Um, and then these are actually the, I've written the inverses of the permutation, so it's a little hard to read. Uh, but anyway, you get three different neighbors and for each vertex, its neighbors are the uh, permutations you get by performing an adjacent transposition. That is, you take two adjacent elements and you switch. Um, and so the one skeleton is the Hasse diagram of the weak Bruja order on the symmetric group. This is the, the poset where the bottom element is the identity and the top element is the reverse identity. And you work your way up the poset by performing adjacent transpositions. Um, so it's also the Cayley graph uh, where the generators are the adjacent transpositions, the Cayley graphs of the, Cayley graph of, uh, the symmetric group. And then, like I mentioned a minute ago, because the sum of the coordinates is constant across all of these vertices, well, actually, this lives in a one dimension lower, a co-dimension one uh, affine subspace of, of n-dimensional space. It's not full dimensional, but it's only deficient by one. Now, how did this come up? Um, all three of those people, if you look them up, they're, they're computer scientists. 
um, and they mostly work in machine learning. So it turns out this actually comes from a machine learning problem known as the problem of estimating feature importances. Uh, there's all these contexts in machine learning where uh, you've got lots of inputs that you want to learn from, lots of features of the objects of study. And you want to figure out, you know, can I predict something or can I estimate something based on all of those inputs? Those inputs are called features. Uh, it's a natural thing to call them. They're just statistics of the underlying objects. And uh, uh, those features, though, they vary in importance. And very often, there's so many features. You can imagine in, a, in an image, each pixel is a, is a feature. Uh, it's uh, even maybe three features. You get an R value, a G value, and a B value, red, green, blue, and then also a, an alpha value, the transparency. Um, it's pretty rich. There's a lot of features. And so very frequently, this, this happens, that there's just too many features to, to work with. You want to um, instead find a key set of important features and disregard the rest and try to learn from them. It makes the, the problem more computationally tractable. It makes it... Um, explainable there's this whole area of ai called explainable ai so you're you're trying to produce a model that a human being can understand what the system learned um, so estimating feature importance is looking at the different features and determining or at least estimating how important they are to the final decision is really uh, a, a hot area of research in machine learning these days and it's it's if you want to be computationally efficient it's even important in applications, which uh, turns out is exactly, this, this is being used apparently by NVIDIA at this point, the, the stuff I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so um, there's a, a really classical way to estimate future importances before people even had the words feature and importances. Um, well, they had those words, but didn't refer to what we think of as today. Um, the idea is that it's this thing called a Shapley value. The idea is that you're gonna adopt the features one at a time. And as you do it, you watch uh, how much impact it has on the uh, some cost measure or benefit measure of the model. So usually this is your, your ability, your, your correctness in the predictions and precision or, or accuracy of your predictions, um, some measure of how good your model is. You can look at, as you go from, from feature to feature, how much the, uh, the fidelity of your model improves. And um, the problem though, you might anticipate, is that when you adopt a feature, the previously adopted features could make the newly adopted feature more or less important. It, it depends, there's a kind of coalitional effect where maybe all of the information gained by uh, adopting feature number 17 is already present in, a, in features one through 16 and then the benefit is zero. But if you adopted feature 17 first, then you'd get a large benefit out of it. And so the idea is we're, what we really wanna do is we wanna average over all of the possible orderings of features. As you go through them one by one, what is this marginal improvement or this, the value of each one of the features, but average over all of the possible orderings of the, um, of the features. So in other words, all the permutations of the features. That's a reasonable thing to, to look at. And indeed, there's quite a bit of literature on the Shapley value. And so this is, just to summarize, this is a way to think about or way to measure how important all the different features are if you're taking into account the impact of multi-feature importance, um, these coalitions of features. Problem, as you may have noticed, n factorial is big. And so you can't possibly list all of the n factorial uh, orderings of the features. And uh, especially, you know, if, if the number of features is really large, n factorial is just completely out of hand. So one way to deal with this is, well, you could instead replace the set of all the permutations of the features with some representative set, something that's going to do a good job of representing uh, the space of all permutations. And this is the notion is you want a sort of quasi-random set of permutations, something that, that is, uh, looks like a random set is well distributed throughout the space of permutations. Um, you might try a random set, in fact, a random, random things tend to be quasi-random. And uh, well, that works, but it turns out it doesn't converge very quickly. And uh, something that if you haven't encountered this before is a little bit surprising, 
uh, often it's possible to get a better estimate of something you're trying to estimate um, uh, from a, a well-chosen, uh, carefully distributed set than it is from a random set. Random sets, the, the gaps between the objects tend to be tend to vary quite a bit in their, their uh, distance from each other. If you picked a set that's well distributed uh, or equi-distributed, uh, you can find something often that's better than random and get better convergence properties. So the question here was, is there a better family than just random? Because random is not, uh, it turns out in this instance, it doesn't work all that well. Um, so what do we mean by that? I, I want somehow a set of, of permutations. And like I said, we could do a random set, but really you want, you want to enforce that they're distant from each other. You want, you want the, the nearest pair of permutations to be as far apart as possible. So you want some sort of orthogonality between the permutations, near orthogonality. But the kernel with respect to which you're orthogonal, uh, essentially the, the bilinear form with respect to which you're orthogonal, um, is going to matter a lot. Right? So this, is gonna, this imposes a geometry on the space of permutations and you wanna choose a, a, a notion of distance well so that the quasi-random set of permutations is first of all, straightforward to compute and second of all, does a good job of providing an estimate. So uh, one possibility for a kernel, and this is a, this is a, a really classical uh, notion of distance between permutations, is called the Kendall tau. Um, it's basically just the number of inversions that it takes to get from one permutation to another. So it's the, the number of adjacent transpositions, the minimum number of adjacent transpositions it takes to get from one to the other. One way of saying that is it's the number of inversions of the permutation sigma inverse sigma prime if you're measuring the distance between sigma and sigma prime. An inversion is just when two elements of the permutation are out of order. So if sigma of i is less than sigma of j and i is less than j, then those two elements are in order. But if sigma of i is greater than sigma of j, but i is less than j, then they're out of order. That's called an inversion. Um, and a, a non-inversion is sometimes called a non-inversion. Um, I, I would maybe like to call it a version, but people don't do that. So anyway, it's the, we have inversions and then non-inversions. Of course, they add up to n choose two because the total number of pairs of elements is n choose two. So the idea is we're going to measure the distance between two permutations using uh, the relative number of inversions between them. And well, okay, so we're not actually going to use that raw quantity. We'll normalize it so that our measure of distance goes from zero from negative one to one. So the if they're as far apart as possible, it's going to be negative one. And if they're perfectly aligned, it's going to be one, um, right? Because if the number of inversions is n choose two, this quantity is negative one. And if it's zero, if the number of inversions is zero, that means that sigma and sigma prime actually agree everywhere, then it's one. So yeah, when sigma equals sigma prime, you get a Kendall tau value of one. And if one is literally the exact reverse of the other one, you'll get uh, negative one. And then there's a sense in which you could be in between. And the idea is a two, two permutations are orthogonal with respect to the Kendall tau kernel if this quantity is zero or approximately zero. The idea being that uh, for about half of the pairs, they're reversed between the two permutations. And for about half of the pairs, they're in the same order in the two permutations. I'll call that the combinatorial equator of the permutation. Because of course, this is a function of pairs of vertices of the permutahedron, as well as of the symmetric group. So this provides us with a kind of equator. Actually, uh, really what I mean by combinatorial equator is the, the set of sigmas so that the Kendall tau with respect to the identity is zero or approximately zero. Now, choosing orthogonal vectors with respect to the Kendall tau is, as you might expect, slow or hard. Um, it's not, it's a, it's a difficult combinatorial problem to come up with a, let's say, maximal family of uh, permutations which uh, minimize the maximum absolute value of Kendall tau um, for a given number of permutations or something like that. So instead, we'd like to just use geometry instead of this, this strange measure of distance in the permutahedron, the Kendall tau. What if we could just use dot product? this ordinary 
uh, ordinary uh, dot product and the, the distance that that induces, the, the two norm. So what I mean by that is we're gonna take those permutations sigma and sigma prime, we're gonna apply the affine map that just pushes them out onto the surface of the appropriate dimensional sphere and centers the sphere at the origin. So just, it's just the affine map that takes the, the, that standard simplex, the, the hyperplane containing the standard simplex and uh, projects it down in dimension by one to get rid of the extraneous dimension and centers it at the origin. And then also scales it so that the permutahedron is actually circumscribed by the unit sphere. That's an A. And then we're gonna use dot product. Okay, so here's a visualization of the order four, the permutation with uh, uh, on n equals four. And here I, I've, I've pictured the geometric equator and also the combinatorial equator. So the geometric equator, this is literally just where the, the plane uh, that encodes orthogonality from the identity permutation where that cuts through the permutation or through the permutahedron and more generally the, the sphere that is circumscribing the permutahedron, that's this blue circle. So those six, six, eight, eight vertices of the permutahedron uh, that lie on the, the geometric equator, they're in blue here. Um, and that's the, that's the geometric equator of the permutahedron. The combinatorial equator, are the points of the permutahedron which are combinatorially three away from both the north and south poles. So if you notice the south pole is the identity permutation here, one, two, three, four. North pole is the reverse identity, four, three, two, one. And since Kendall tau is just a linear function of affine function of the number of inversions, as you move from edge to edge here, Kendall tau is just incremented by the same quantity. And so we really just want something that's equidistant in the graph in this one skeleton from the north and south poles. So you can figure out, if you look at the two, four, one, three vertex that's sort of near the middle here, its number of inversions from one, two, three, four is three, because if you follow an edge, you get an adjacent transposition as you move from two, four, one, three to one, four, three, two, three, and then another inversion you pick up by performing an adjacent transposition to move to the one, three, two, four uh, vertex. And then finally one more inversion to get to one, two, three, four. So it's distance to one, two, three, four is three and it's distance to four, three, two, one is three. Well, there are one, two, three, four, five, six. The ones in pink here are the combinatorial equator. Those are the vertices that are at distance three in this graph from both the north and south, north and south poles. And you notice there's not a perfect alignment between the combinatorial and geometric equators here. There's some vertices that are on the combinatorial equator, but not the geometric equator. Those are in blue. There's some vertices that are on the combinatorial equator. Sorry, the other way around. Those are in pink. The ones that are on the geometric equator, but not the combinatorial equator are in blue. And then the ones that are on both are, have, are shaded with both colors. But it's not a perfect overlap. You can see they're close to each other. Though. So you might wonder, how close are they? Is this actually a good approximation? Are the, the two equators near each other or not? Because we'd like to use the, the geometric equator as a replacement for the combinatorial equator. It, the dot product is a lot easier to compute than Kendall tau. Well, all right, so here's the, here's the theorem that relates the two. Um, this thing's a mess, so let me uh, uh, try to illustrate a little bit. The blue is the upper bound. And that's the dot product. So remember, A is this linear transformation onto the unit sphere. And uh, so the, you transform A with the linear transformation, take its dot product with the transform of, of sigma prime. Um, and uh, so the vertical axis is the dot product and they're orthogonal if it's zero. Uh, the horizontal axis is the Kendall tau distance between the two. So you can see they do track together. Um, but uh, we've got an upper bound in blue and a lower bound in, in red. That's these, these strange looking functions that I've put in red and blue boxes. And then the, uh, the dot product, the range of possible dot products, at least as, as far as these bounds go, is in green. So you can see for various levels of dot product, uh, if the dot product is at some level, this is the, the possible range of Kendall tau values. Um, it's uh, 
it's not every it's not all the way from negative one to one but uh it's also not exactly on the line y equals x so there's some looks like there's some wiggle room um, in particular um, if you just look at the dot product being zero that's the most interesting case because that's the uh, that's the competence, that's the geometric equator. Um, Kendall tau is between negative a half and a half. So I, I have little low ones here because this is really in the limit as n goes to infinity. But the idea is that if you're close to the combinatorial equator, then Kendall tau is between negative a half and a half. Or to say that another way, that if two permutations are geometrically approximately orthogonal, then with respect to the number of inversions, they differ by between a quarter and three quarters of the possible inversions. That's what that negative a half to one half turns into a quarter to three quarters. So if two permutations are, are essentially orthogonal, then the number of inversions in which they differ is somewhere between a quarter of the possible number of inversions and three quarters of the possible number of inversions. That's that, that horizontal line, the green line segment here going from negative a half to a half. So of course, reasonable question, is this tight? And actually, I don't know. Um, so here is a sample. This is, I think, 15 million permutations of, uh, I remember, I think it was n equals 12, um, uh, random, randomly selected permutations uniformly at random. Those are the, the blue dots here. Our upper bounds in orange and the lower bounds in green. You could see the, the blue stuff is not all the way to the edges. Um, so the, maybe if you looked at all the possible permutations, it really would fill in this, this uh, sort of eye-shaped thing or walnut-shaped uh, object, almond-shaped object. It's not, not walnut. Um, and, uh, but you know, it doesn't look like it. It looks like it, it sticks closer to some maybe S-shaped curve that goes between the 0, 0, and 1, 1 point. Minus one, minus one, one, one. Um, and uh, in fact, I, I don't know whether these bounds are tight. So here is um, a demonstration that, uh, well, it's not far from the truth, at least. So this permutation, what I've done here is imagine you plot a permutation. Literally, you plot sigma of one at one and sigma of two at two and sigma of three at three, et cetera. So it's the, the, just the graph of sigma. And then you zoom out enough that it looks like, well, this object. So imagine this is your permutation. This, if you're familiar with permutons, this is really a permuton that you're looking at. Um, so this is a permutation that is decreasing with slope negative one up to about one over the cube root of two, fraction of the possible values. And then after that, it's slope one. Um, that permutation, uh, it turns out that's exactly at the geometric equator. So the dot product of this with the identity permutation is, well, it's zero if you scale it appropriately. Because right? this is, of course, it's going to have a, a dot product that's positive because these are all positive. But if you, you scale it so that it's now uh, going from negative one to one instead of uh, zero to one, you get a dot product of zero. So this is on the geometric equator. But uh, how about what's the number of inversions? Well, the number of inversions, it turns out, is about n squared times two to the minus four thirds, which is, that's about 63% of n choose two. 63% well, is less than 75%, which is that three quarters. And uh, the uh, uh, Kendall tau, um, that, that means that that 75% turns into negative 0.26, which is bigger than negative a half, which corresponds to that one half above. So. Because right, there's two ways of viewing it. You could view it just as inversions, or you could transform it into the Kindle tab. So 63% is not quite 75%, not far, but it's certainly bigger than 50. So you, you, the answer is not 50%, but uh, it, could, it's a, it could be somewhere between 63% and 75%. And I, I, I should say, I haven't worked hard to try to find a better permutation. This was just playing around with a few examples. Uh, so maybe you could do better by just trying out a few things. But uh, uh, certainly, it shows that we don't we don't know if the, the bounds are tighter. Um, so let me just uh, suggest the proof. I'm not going to, of course, give all the details, but um, this is this is the the proof of the upper and lower bound. 
let me just uh, introduce bubble sort because it's going to be a key ingredient of the food. But bubble sorting is, if you've never seen sorting before, you've never seen the algorithmic problem sorting before, it might be the first thing you think of. I said, here's a list of numbers. Can you put them in order, please? Uh, you might try to bubble sort. Bubble sort, you just move from left to right. And as soon as you encounter something that's out of order, you bubble it one to the left. So you imagine that sometimes it's drawn vertically and it's really like things are bubbling to the top. So we're just gonna keep doing that. We're gonna read through the list. And as soon as you encounter something that's out of order, we'll bubble it one to the left. And if you think about moving from the identity permutation to some prescribed permutation, that means that whenever you find an element that's greater than the element to its right, or less than the element to its right, then you swap it with the element to its right. And then you start over, you start reading left to right again. You just keep doing that until it terminates. If you think about it for a minute, the, the number of inversions is going to be increasing as you do this. And so you'll, you'll never get into a loop. It's definitely a terminating process and it ends with the permutation that you're in. So this gets you from the identity permutation to the permutation that you're targeting. And, uh, and it does so by moving along the edges of that hosodire, along the, the one skeleton of the permutahedron. So you could, this is the basic idea, you could try to track what happens to the dot product of a permutation and the identity permutation as you move along edges of the permutahedron following a bubble sort. All right, so let's just look at an example. This is a proof by example. Um, so consider permutation pi of the numbers one through nine that in one line notation is this completely randomly chosen three, one, four, five, nine, two, six, eight, seven. Um, and uh, uh, right, so by one line notation, if you haven't seen this before, this means that sigma of one is three and sigma of two is one and sigma of three is four, et cetera. Um, just a compact way to present a permutation. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna track, we're gonna perform bubble sort on the identity permutation to get to this permutation, three, one, four, et cetera. Um, and as we do it, we're gonna track what happens to the dot product of the identity and our partial pi. So notice the number of inversions of this permutation, three, one, four, five, et cetera, is nine. That means our bubble sort is gonna take nine steps. And uh, okay, let's start with, Pi naught is the identity. We're going to move to pi nine is, well, pi itself. That's our target permutation. And we're going to watch what happens, the, the dot product, the identity with our pi j's as we move from one pi j to pi j plus one as these adjacent transpositions are applied. What happens to that dot product? All right, so if you look at the identity dotted with pi j minus one and then compare it to the identity dotted with pi j, everything's the same except for some spot, which I'll call k. At some position k, position k and k plus one got swapped. So whatever value was sitting at k, that's pi of k, call it a sub k, that's being swapped with a sub k plus one, which is it's just another name for pi of k plus one. I just didn't want to index the pi's in a confusing way. Those just swapped roles. And so everything else is the same. The dot product uh, changes by this so-called delta of the identity dotted with pi j, let's call it. It's just the identity dotted with pi j minus the identity dotted with pi j minus one. How much does it change? Well, we have k times a k plus one in the after the adjacent transition, before it was k times a, a, uh, a k. So that gives you this, the first term of the sum. Second term of the sum comes from the k plus one term. And so nearly everything cancels and you're just left with a k minus a k plus one. That's handy. That means that when you perform an adjacent transposition on a permutation, the two elements that you swap, the pi of k and pi of k plus one, those two elements, when you swap them, the amount by which the dot product of the identity with the permutation changes, is just the difference of the two values you swap. So if we can just keep track as we move along the edges of the permutahedron, keep track of which two elements are getting swapped, not the positions of the elements, but the permutation applied to those elements, which two elements are getting swapped. Those differences are gonna give us, if you add them all up, that's the total change from the starting point, from the identity dotted with itself. That's the, that'll be the total change in the value of the identity dotted with the permutation 
we'll have a way to compute or at least estimate the uh, uh, the dot product of the final pi dotted with the identity. So here's what happens if you apply adjacent transpositions to our permutation, the, the identity permutation to get to that permutation pi. Um, just looking at, look at the, the first example. So if, if pi naught is the identity, you, you, the first bubble that you perform is you swap the element that's in position two with the element position three. You might say that it's bubbling at position two. And then, okay, that's the adjacent transposition three, two. So I'm, I'm reading the, the row one of this table, not, not row zero, but row one. And then how much does the, uh, does the dot product change? Well, it's three minus two, because those are the two elements we swapped. Notice you're always uh, changing by a positive amount because, uh, well, depending on how you think of it, because it's uh, a larger element is changing places with a smaller element, it's moving to its left. That's always happening in bubble sort, you never go backwards. So the change is one, and the number of inversions, of course, goes up by one, because every time you perform an adjacent transposition, the number of inversions just changes by one. And Kendall Tau is now, well, okay, so instead of the inversions changing by one each time, number of inversions changing by one, Kendall Tau is changing by one over the total possible number of inversions, which is 36 here. So, uh, so you get a change of, of uh, uh, well, it's actually two over 36 because it, remember it was twice the number of inversions divided by n choose two. So that's, it's gonna change by two over 36 each time, one or one eighteenth, but I've written them as fractions of 36. And then the dot product is changing by, well, we started at 285. If you dot the identity with itself, you get 285. It's going down by one because the dot, dot product changes by one. Uh, this delta was one. Now, okay, look at, the, look at the second line. The second line, now you're swapping the first and second elements. The one and three are out of order. And so they get swapped. When you do that, one and three are the elements that are getting swapped. Three minus one is two. So that's how much the number of inversions changes now. Number, sorry, the, how much the dot product changes. The number of inversions is two. That means that the Kendall Tau is now 32 over 36, but the dot product is now 282 because we took 284 and subtracted two from it. And just to pick on another row here, if you look at row seven, um, as you move from row seven to row eight, actually, yeah, look at row eight. In row eight, if you swap the elements, so you're gonna bubble at position five, that means swapping the elements that are position six and five, those are the numbers two and nine. When they get swapped, that's a delta of seven, right? And nine minus two is seven. So the dot product is changing by seven, is dropping by seven. The number of inversions is now eight. So Kendall Tau is 20, 36, but the dot product is now 264. Because if you've been keeping track of those changes all along the way, you're now, you land at 271 minus seven, which is 264. So, okay, let's try to be systematic about this, about this table, of course, this is just one example. What's happening is notice under elements swapped, under elements swapped, all of those pairs are distinct. The reason is you never swap two elements and then swap them back later. Bubble sort only moves, only moves these values in one direction. Things only percolate to the left. You'll never swap two values and then later on swap them back. So you only ever see one of these pairs twice. Now you don't see all possible pairs, but you might wonder which pairs do you see? Well. Actually, in this complete graph I've drawn on nine vertices, you can see the pairs that got moved. So two, three occurs, and there's the edge two, three, and two, nine occurs, and there's the edge two, nine, et cetera. So these are actually exactly the nine edges that we saw as pairs occur in the adjacent uh, transpositions. And the, those red numbers that are written on the edges, those are, those are the weights of the edges. It's the just absolute value of the difference of the end vertices because that's the delta. That's how much the, the quantity, uh, the, the dot product changed when we performed that particular adjacent transposition. So if you look, when, when we performed the two nine transposition, the, the one that swapped the values two and nine, delta changes by seven. So the weight of that edge is seven and the total change is gonna be the sum of all those red numbers. So the idea is we've got the complete graph on nine vertices and all the edges are weighted by absolute value of the difference of the two end vertices. And we have some subgraph of that 
that comes from which adjacent transpositions are happening. And the sum of all the weights of that subgraph, so the, the weight of the subgraph, is the difference between 285 and 263. It's the total amount by which the dot product changes as we perform the bubble sort. So 263 is 285 minus the sum of all of those, those edge weights. Where are these numbers coming from? Okay, so first of all, notice the sum of the edge weights, one plus two plus two plus three, I'm just adding up the red numbers. That's, let's try to bound that, right? So what, what's the least that that could possibly be? If you had nine edges here, what's the least that they could possibly add up to? Well, you've got eight ones and seven twos and six threes, et cetera, right? If you think about it for a minute, there's only one place that a difference of eight, a weight of eight occurs, that's on the one nine edge. So there's only one eight, but there's two sevens and three sixes and et cetera. So you could have, if you had nine edges, eight of them in theory could be ones. And then you run out of ones and you have to use a two. So this quantity, the sum of all the edges, the edge weight, the, the weight of the subgraph, it's at least eight times one plus one times two. And it's at most, eight plus two sevens plus three sixes plus, well, three fives, because you don't get four fives. We've only got nine edges to work with here. And if you use up nine values, starting from one eight, two sevens, three sixes, et cetera, this is what you get. You get three fives, three sixes, two sevens, and an eight. That's the most you could possibly, just being greedy about it. So that's a lower bound of it. seems like you couldn't get much out of this, right? I'm really giving a lot away. But if you think about it for a minute, when the number of edges approaches n choose two, you're going to get actually pretty good bounds. Or if the number of edges is near zero, you're going to get pretty good bounds. So actually the bounds are going to meet at both endpoints, which is why there's some hope for the, this method. Um, and where's that 285 coming from? Well, that's the sum of all of the, remember identity dotted with the identity. It's just the sum of the squares of j squared as j goes from one up to n. And that's, you know, simple formula for that. Some of the first several squares, first n squares, it's around n cubed over three, because right? you get n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six. So the two and the six give you a third. It's about an n cubed over three. So that, that's where 285 is coming. From. All right, so if n is the number of vertices, that's the length, just total length of the permutation. M is the number of edges, that's the total number of inversions then the starting value here is about n cubed over three. The lower bound is gonna be n minus one ones, the sum of those, plus n minus two twos, plus n minus three three, et cetera, up to n minus t t's. Well, actually in that last one, you might not get all of them, but it's not gonna have a, an impact asymptotically. And uh, well, what's t? Well, t is whatever gets you to m edges. So the idea is that the sum of n minus one and n minus two up to n minus t, it should add up to n. Well, again, not exactly because the, the last one, you might have to leave off a few of the elements, but asymptotically, it's not gonna matter. The sum of this is, well, it's n t and then something like t squared over two, so I'm just a little approximate, but again, I, I'm just shoving under the rug things that end up not mattering asymptotically. So you get n t minus t squared over two, and so, yeah, if you solve that for t, it's just quadratic equation. You get that t is about n minus the square root of n squared minus 2m. Just to point out, remember, m is the number of edges. So that varies between 0 and n squared over 2. At 0, you get t is 0. In other words, you get no terms. So, of course, you don't get any terms because we don't have any edges. When m is n squared over 2, that is, you get all of the edges, then this quantity is n squared minus n squared, which is zero squared of that is zero. You get all n edges. So, right, so t are all n terms here. You get all of the edges. So this is gonna vary from none of the edges to all of the edges uh, via this quantity t. And yeah, if you add up, what is the sum gonna add up to? Well, you get one times n minus one plus two times n minus two plus all up to t times n minus t. That just adds up to, well, nt squared over two and then minus t cubed over three approximately. Again, I'm, I'm just shoving the things that don't matter asymptotically under the rug. It adds up to this weird quantity m, if you plug in this quantity for, for t, um, the expression for t there, you get m times n plus n squared minus two m to the three s minus n cubed all over three. If you think about it again, if you plug in zero, 
you get n squared to the three halves. So that's n cubed minus n cubed is zero. So you just get m times n, but m is zero. So it's just zero. So yeah, so you get zero when it's zero. If m is n squared over two, you get zero minus n cubed over three. So negative n cubed over three, but then m is n squared over two. So you get n cubed over two minus n cubed, that's n cubed over six. So you can see where the, where the bound is coming from. And then you apply a similar analysis on that. That's the quantity you get for the, the lower bound. You have similar analysis for the lower, for the upper bound. It's the same deal, basically slightly simpler formula. Again, you could check, you plug in zero, plug in n squared over two, you get the right quantities. So that gives you, when you subtract that from n cubed over three, because remember we had to subtract from the starting value, you get these two bounds. And okay, well, that doesn't look exactly like what I stated as the main theorem, but not hard to see that if you transform everything by an affine, you know, affine transformations, so the number of inversions times two divided by n choose two, subtracted from one, that's this Kendall tau. The identity dotted with the permutation, you have to transform that to put it on the unit sphere. But again, it's just an affine transformation. If you perform the appropriate affine transformations, that gives you the bounds that I stated in the original, the original uh, uh, main theorem. And uh, you know, there's a little bit to check because, of course, I, I I ignored all the asymptotically negligible terms, but it turns out everything is fine. Um, now, like I said, this is maybe not tight. So why not tight? It seems like this, this pins down what's going on. Well, one reason that this isn't tight is that we're not taking advantage of the fact that well, maybe not every subgraph is possible. You have this weighted complete graph and we're looking at all the possible subgraphs. You can't actually get all the possible subgraphs. N factorial, which is the total number of bubble sort subgraphs you can get, N factorial is a lot smaller than two to the N choose two. So you don't actually get all the graphs. There's something, some graphs you can't get. What can't you get, right? Because if you could take advantage of the fact that not all graphs are possible, maybe you could tighten those bounds. Um, well, which, which graphs can't you get? For example, here's an ordered graph. So the labeled graph back in that labeled complete graph that you can't get. Notice you can't get I to pass K, so suppose I is less than J is less than K. You can't get I to pass K in the bubble sort without I either passing through J at some point first or K uh, passing through J, right? They've, you you got to get one of the, maybe both, but you certainly can't get the I K edge without getting I J or J K, at least one of the two. So in that, in that graph, in just the labeled graph, you can't get um, a subgraph uh, that has I K, you can't get the, the one edge subgraph on three vertices that has I K, but not I J or J. So there's lots of subgraphs that are not possible. And actually, if you, if you don't like the labeling, and I, I don't like the labeling, it turns out that you can't get a C5 actually and induce C5 with any label. So these subgraphs are C5 free, they're induce C5 free subgraphs. Even that might tighten the bound. You just, you look at what are the possible values for that upper bound and lower bound. If we don't allow any subgraphs, so you're, you're not greedily selecting the edges to, be, to include, but in fact, no C5s, no induced C5s are allowed, then maybe you could do even better with the bounds. But I haven't really even tried. So this is a, uh, to improve on those bounds. So there's a wide open question here. Can you tighten those bounds? And this is, this is how you might go about it. With that, all thank you. All right, uh, thanks, Josh. If everyone could uh, thank Josh in some way. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll open the floor for questions. Um, I have a question. Um, so this may have been what you were hinting at, uh, but can you go back to that slide with the chart uh, with the permutation pi? Um, I, or no, uh, sorry, maybe the one with the, yeah, this one. 
Um, so I was thinking, uh, this may have been what you were hinting at at the end there, but with this upper bound here, you're, you're just looking at the, the nine largest possible number of differences between the vertices. But when you go through this bubble sort one at a time, like the first time you swap, the largest the distance could be is po possibly is one, right? Because no matter where you make that swap, it's it's going to swap adjacent elements. And then like the second time you do it, I would say the largest you could possibly swap would be, I guess, two. Is that true? And, and so on and so on. So like, mm -hmm. could you could like using that? Could you get maybe a, a different upper bound or or I don't know if that would help <laughs> or or. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about. Um, it's interesting, right? There's all this information we're not taking advantage of, and which edges can even appear. And like you said, like at the beginning, you only get low weight edges, um, which I haven't tried to take advantage of at all with the upper bound. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, you can only get these high weight edges towards the end when there's been enough mixing of the the entries of the permutation that some large numbers could actually pass by some small numbers. At the beginning, they're far away from each other. Can't. Um, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that, you know, I think if, if you take better advantage of that, you could probably improve the balance. Now, do they improve asymptotically? I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there's certainly something that could be said there. Um, yeah, maybe it's more than just saying that there aren't any C5s. Maybe it's looking closely at you know, the, the fact that these small weight edges occur necessarily at the beginning and you can only get the high weight edges towards the end. Yeah, and only under these special conditions where, you know, like you've moved for or the, the number one, like a lot, you know, to the right already. And then, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Um, see, any other questions for Josh? I should also mention there's a, there are other kernels. There's a Spearman's row kernel. There's, a, there's Ma the Mallows kernel. There's a couple of these like classical kernels that measure the distance between two permutations. And some of their relations to each other are known. So basically, so other folks have shown that you can bound some of them in terms of other ones, functions of other ones. But, uh, uh, we didn't try to compare the geometric dot product, the ordinary dot product, with uh, any of these other kernels. It, it, it turns out in this context, Kendall Tau was the, it's the most natural choice um, from the machine learning perspective. And so that's why we're harping on Kendall Tau. It's also very combinatorially natural. You can see it's just the distance in the one skeleton of the permutahedron. Um, or the, the distance in the Bruja order, the weak Bruja order. But, uh, uh, but you might think about Spearman or Mallows or some of the other ones too. We, we didn't make any attempt to analyze those. So there's, there's sort of, a, for any given notion of distance between permutations, there's an interesting question here about the relationship between the geometric equator and the equator with respect to your favorite kernel. I just want to point that out. There's lots of just completely unexplored questions here. Though or low-hanging fruit. Very cool. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and thank Josh again. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was an excellent talk. I enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just say, I know I'll send out my email on Monday like I've been doing. Uh, but I'll just say that next week's talk is planned to be in person. So uh, we can see how that goes. It's going to be the first time in a little while. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and, and close up this. And which, do you know which room? Do you know which room? Uh, it'll be in the Coliseum uh, 1000A, I believe. But it's the large conference room in, in uh, front of Julia's desk. So or <laughs> I think we st I, I still have a little bit of testing to do in that room, but you know we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, I knew. <laughs>
But um, yeah, thanks again, Josh. And uh, I think with that, we'll go ahead and we'll close up the seminar for today.